Welcome to our second of the Fall Quarter International Series Lecture. And today we have with us Dr. Marie Eaton from Fairhaven College. I very briefly want to mention before I introduce her, her and her lecture more to show you that on your seat you have the whole roster of the lectures uh, for the whole fall quarter. So each of the lecture is in this room uh, at, at exactly this time on Tuesday from 12 to 1. The next uh, week's lecture is actually one that I'll be giving on Mongol Empire. <laughs> and today we have a real treat to have with us someone who has had a distinguished career as an administrator, wow. as a teacher who has excelled in the classroom, and also as a, a, a researcher who has done a lot of interesting um, and original um, uh, uh, scholarship. And uh, Dr. Eaton today will talk to you about her long experience with service learning mm -hmm. in various parts of the world. And I think that she needs no more introduction than those brief words that I've just given you. So I'm going to give the stage to her for the full amount of time. Let's welcome our guest. Thank you. It's a, a very gracious introduction. So I um, was on sabbatical last year studying uh, childhood. And as part of that sabbatical experience, I had the opportunity to travel uh, on two different trips, one to Thailand and India with the Institute for Village Studies, and one to Kenya with uh, Center for Service Learning and uh, colleagues, um, at, uh, um, including student colleagues. And so what I want to talk about using those two trips as a case study is I want to talk a little bit about international service learning and why uh, this, this kind of model of allowing, uh, giving students the opportunity to not only study abroad uh, and in other countries, but also to do a meaningful service work that connects to um, their studies and to the needs of the agencies uh, is a model to be exploring. And I think uh, some of you in the room uh, definitely are doing that and I know um, are interested in the same thing. So I have two student colleagues with me today, Catherine Bakken and Isabel Delis who uh, went with me, and uh, uh, toward the end of the presentation, I'm going to give them a chance uh, to uh, talk a little bit about their experiences so you can hear from them uh, the, the kind of impact it has had for them. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, global citizenship. Um, those of you in the room who are interested in international study, uh, you know that we're trying to prepare students to face global issues and to become global citizens and that um, developing global literacy in this day and age is uh, a little bit like thinking about computer literacy a decade ago, that without a, a deeper understanding of the world and its problems, uh, we're not going to be able to grapple with the kinds of issues that are facing us as a uh, community, us as a, a nation, and us as a world. Um, so um, some of the foreign studies programs approach that uh, engagement with global citizenship with an, um, a, an exclusive focus on the development of the, the U.S. student in their global citizenship. And what I want to be exploring with you today is uh, uh, using service learning as a way to think of global citizenship as a, as a reciprocal relationship between our students and Western Washington University with community agencies in uh, other countries that are doing important work in their own communities, um, seeing them as sister institutions. So um, the, we're trying to advance the understanding of society, culture, and the world issues by allowing our students to test their own scholarship, their own understanding of the issues in their disciplines against practical experience and theory in a cultural context. Um, and this, in the, uh, with an opportunity to allow that service to occur in places uh, where their own perceptions of, um, of uh, cultural practice and um, uh, ritual might be different than their own, I think it, uh, it allows them to have a, a transformative experience while they're ex uh, exploring culture. But there's some key elements that are very important uh, in this. So one important element is reciprocity. And this is, uh, those of you that have worked in the field of service learning know that this is an, a very essential concept to service learning, that, that as uh, um, 
as we develop um, projects to be, uh, to be developed in another country, we must do that in a way that actually uh, allows a, a, an open exchange between the agency that might be served and the agency and our students. Um, so that the, uh, the outcomes are uh, in that setting are not only those outcomes that we might have developed for the student in terms of their discipline, or, but also outcomes that are important to the agency. So this is Tim Costello, um, who's right here in the audience, who's, a, who's the Director of Service Learning here at Western. And uh, Maureen Okundi, who is the Director of the Mbogo Girls Academy, which is one of the sites that we went to and Christy Tyron, who is a faculty member in business and was one of my colleagues on the trip. And I'll be going, uh, giving you some examples later on about the kinds of projects that we developed in reciprocity with, uh, to develop that kind of reciprocal relationship with Mbogo. Um, through this kind of reciprocal relationship, I think the students uh, are able to develop a deeper understanding of all that the, ag the in international agency itself has to offer. I mean, sometimes when we go to do service work in another country, we see ourselves as the benefactors to, to that agency that might have some needs, but we may have less understanding of the ways that we are also uh, getting back from that agency and developing um, capacities ourselves through the work that we do together. These community partners, uh, partnerships must be developed on uh, a sense of mutual accept, uh, esteem, respect and esteem. And a well-developed international service learning program demands that we um, uh, develop relationships with community partners that uh, have a long-term commitment. You can't, uh, you can't really have a good uh, international service learning project where you drop in once and then drop out again. It takes time to develop the relationships with an agency and the kinds of trust and respect that are needed to develop those sites. Um, and uh, in each of the uh, case studies that I'm going to share with you, um, th these projects have been developed or are being developed over a longer period of time with the commitment that, uh, that we will return and, uh, and uh, engage with that agency again. Well, my little arrows kind of all went wacky. So <laughs> the, that's supposed to be going in a circle. Oh. It looked different in my own screen. So that the, um, the, this, these partnerships were an engagement of local community partners. So the uh, Slum Doctor Program, which is a local nonprofit here based in Bellingham uh, that serves um, different projects in Kenya and the Institute for Village Studies, which is a nonprofit that helps take students to uh, East Asia and has long-term standing relationships with uh, agencies in East Asia, or Southeast Asia. Um, also, uh, the, between Western Washington <coughs> University, the Center for Service Learning, and Fairhaven College, um, and then international partners, uh, which I will be talking about now. So the Mboga Girls Academy, uh, Tonglen, which is in, uh, Dharamsala and SAVE, which is in Sarnath, India. These three international partners are in different phases of development, and I kind of want to talk through uh, how these, uh, we're seeing these projects. So the first one I want to talk about is Tonglen. Tonglen is a uh, Rajasthani refugee camp that is in lower Dharamsala, and um, it is uh, about 700 people live in the refugee camp. The um, mean age in the camp is 35, uh, and that's not because all the old people leave, it's because they're, they die. Um, uh, it's nearly 100% illiterate. 98% of the children in the camp are uh, malnourished. Um, they, um, most of the people in the refugee camp are working, uh, th this is part their, um, this is the part of India that still has a, uh, a definitely strong informal caste system, although the formality of the caste system is diminishing in India. There is still a very strong informal caste system, and most of the people in this camp are from the beggar class or from what they call the rag picker class, um, so that the, the children in the uh, community and are, are often uh, spending their days begging on the streets of Dharamsala, uh, 
um, and or uh, going through the garbage to uh, pick rags and other um, things that might be recycled. Um, the man you see in the picture is uh, Jam Long, and he is a, a Buddhist um, monk, a uh, Tibetan Buddhist monk. And um, he has taken this, uh, uh, this project on um, to help the Rajasthani community um, develop um, education, uh, uh, better health, and employment. Those are the three targets that they have. This is a site that um, the Institute for Village Studies is just uh, beginning its uh, negotiations with about the ways that uh, students who come on uh, trips to Southeast Asia might actually be able to help um, this uh, site. So the, uh, the, while we were at, at Tonglen, we mostly were doing a walkthrough and a, uh, a small needs assessment and uh, looking at projects, particularly water projects. There's no running water in the camp. There's no access to clean water. And so we began to look at, are there, are there ways in which we could get some of our students involved in a water project, particularly if we collaborated with the Engineers Without Borders? Uh, are there ways that our students might be contributing to it? And we also, oh, we also are looking at education projects. So um, this uh, tent with the um, uh, black plastic over it is the school in, uh, in the camp. Uh, most of the children, uh, come to school, most of the children do not come to school, the ones that do just come for an hour or two a day. So are there ways that our students could be participating in educational projects to build capacity for um, education? Um, the, in 2004, there were no children at all going to school from this camp. And um, by 2009, there were 70 of the children were actually attending school part time. And there are ways that we, uh, we may be able to build ca uh, capacity uh, through some projects that our students could do. Um, and the, the um, camp is currently using some of the students that are in the um, camp to educate their uh, families about immunization and about uh, other health issues in the camp. And there may be ways that we could also become involved in those projects. So um, this year's trip was an exploratory trip, and we spent a lot of time mostly with John Long, uh, talking to him about the, the needs of the camp and then visiting the camp as a walkthrough. A second project that we were involved in in uh, India uh, is one that is more developed, and this is the, called the Social Awareness and Village Education. Um, it was developed by the man on the left. His name is... Uh, Dr. Jain, and Dr. Jain uh, lives in a community. Um, Sarnath is north of Varanasi. It's uh, actually where Buddha gave his first teaching. Uh, so it has great significance in the in the um, Buddhist uh, religion, but it is also uh, a very poor community, and many many of the people in that community are from the Dalit caste which is the, uh, what we used to call the untouchable caste. And most, again, the pro one of the major problems for that caste is uh, mm -hmm. that the access to education it has been very limited. Um, as access to education used to be limited by law. Uh, it, was, it was illegal to teach Dalit uh, people to uh, read and write. It is no longer illegal, but um, because m most of Indian education is uh, tuition-based and fee-based, even fees which would, to an American, seem like almost nothing are outside the capacity of the families to actually accomplish. And so um, Dr. Jain, uh, seeing th this need in his community, that so many of the young people in his community were without access to formal education, has started a network of schools. And he began with, um, by training village women to provide preschool education first. So the uh, Sarnath is the hub, and then um, that the way the community is set up there, the, if you walk for 10 minutes, you're in a new little village. Um, so there's a network of like 10 villages around Sarnath where he has uh, trained um, village women to provide preschool education to uh, to the children in their communities. So while instead of the children going to the fields to work 
with their parents or to sit um, beside the fields as their parents worked. Now the children in the mornings are in a, a small classroom. Um, so this is a, this picture is what it looks like. They're just uh, a little uh, overhang next to the home of the village woman. And the children are uh, studying largely uh, Hindi language, uh, a little bit of English language, numbers, um, uh, number concepts and learning what it means like we do in preschool education here in the United States. What does it mean to be in school? Um, so uh, our students in uh, this project, uh, we before we went we had been in communication with Dr. Chine and he said one of the things they lacked was um, books and that um, uh, he would be very interested if we could bring books uh, that might introduce th the children to the con to um, some of the aspects of a wider society besides Sarnath. And so our, before we went, our students uh, um, made books uh, to take to Sarnath, and we spent some time with the children working uh, with those books and then <coughs> left them behind. Um, this project is in its uh, second year, and so it's a little more developed than, it, than the project uh, in Tonglen. And um, the commitment has been made to uh, take a group of students here again this next year. And each, each year, uh, the a significant amount of time is spent with Dr. Jain finding out from what, what is the next uh, aspect where they would like our, our help. And I think um, it's important. The, um, the other ways in which our students are helping Dr. Jain is that they, uh, coming back to the United States, they have been doing fundraising activities. Um, to provide uh, scholarships for the children who graduate from the elementary school and want to go on to the high school. So he has, Dr. Jain has these preschools and one elementary school that he offers free of charge to other children. And then uh, we're trying to help provide scholarship money for the, st the students. So this is the elementary school. And then the last case study I'd like to talk about is the Mboga Girls Academy. Um, the Mbogo Girls Academy, um, there are a group of faculty from Western who have been working on the development of an international service learning um, project there for a number of years. So Christy Tyron from business, uh, Shirlene Duke from journalism, Angie Harwood from education, Tim Costello from the Center for Service Learning, uh, have uh, worked with this um, the director of this school and with the uh, faculty there to begin to develop projects that we think will um, uh, meet the needs of the school. Um, the, um, we, we also benefited, Western benefited, from the long-term relationship that Mbogo had with the Slum Doctor program so that uh, we were able to build the uh, International Service Learning Project out of that uh, relationship that was already established and the trust <coughs> trust that was already established um, based on that. So one of the activities that we engaged in at Mbogo was a needs assessment. And we met with the students, faculty, and staff at Mbogo um, to uh, uh, develop more complex needs assessment than had been done the prior year. And we tried, we try, we'll be looking ahead to, to develop activities for next summer based on the needs that are identified by the international community partner. Uh, Adam Bogo. Um, the activities we undertook this uh, this year were based on a previous needs assessment, and they included um, some career exploration work with the young women at the um, school. Uh, this is a school that serves um, many young women who have been orphaned by the um, AIDS pandemic in uh, in East Africa. Um, there are other young women there as well. Uh, uh, we also worked on some marketing projects for the Mbogo Academy and uh, on some enterprise projects. And I'm going to let the students talk more about that. I might let Catherine talk more about that. So um, the uh, opportunity for our students to work closely with the students at Mbogo and with the faculty and staff there, I think, uh, was a, a rich opportunity for them. So. That, actually, let's pause there for a second. So maybe um, 
give Isabel and Catherine a chance to reflect a little bit about their experience, and then I want to come back and sort of summarize some of the aspects of international service learning. So maybe, Isabel, you could start and talk a little bit about your experience. If you're interested in that program, Bala is the first one today. It was really wonderful and a great thing to participate in. Um, it was really interesting to go into this village in Sarnath and participate with these children, particularly because it's not just you going in there and um, like helping them get a greater understanding of like, what an American students may look like and learning a little bit of English, but you're also learning so much about their culture and like being able to really see what um, those children do like, in their average day, like what they do when they go to school, how they learn, and then they get to teach you about, you know, their practices and different words and it was just really interesting to see that whole cultural aspect in children instead of adults because um, it's like adult world a lot of times when you're traveling mm -hmm. with the people that you interact with so being able to <coughs> talk with children was really really cool and then I didn't do this but a lot of kids in our group did homestays and that was a really wonderful thing for them to stay with these children and also after um, we traveled around to each little um, hub of villages, we got to just stay and um, talk to the people that live there and see, you know, their farming and see their cattle. And um, that was another interesting thing to do is just see how the kids act in school and then act out of school. And just a really good way to grow as a person and then feel like you're maybe making a little bit of a difference in um, a child's life. They were mm -hmm. just so excited to like see our books and read about animals and um, just like and when they recognize something you just see their faces light up and how excited they got that they would um, that you had like something cross culturally that you could share with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think the Tonwan program has like awesome potential and I think that would be just something that if you're interested in that at all would be a really good thing to mm -hmm. look into because they are like in dire need of help, I think, because they just don't have the means to get themselves out of this economic um, gap that they're in right now. Uh, so being able to go there and um, witness how that community is so different from um, the one in Sarnoff and seeing how it has the potential to start growing mm -hmm. is really good. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk a little bit about the fundraising activities that you and the other students have done. Yeah, we did two, I participated in two. We could have done three um, vendors row um, chai stands um, throughout spring quarter. And we raised, I think, $150 each time, which is enough to send one, I think we usually choose female students, not positive, but one female um, girl to go to high school for a year. Mm -hmm. um, just by selling chai on campus for mm -hmm. a day, you know, taking two hours out of your day, you're really making a difference in someone's whole entire year. Like mm -hmm. That was really great to participate in that. And then the rest of that money is going to Tom Lin's program. He said uh, last time they got an influx of money like that, he um, bought blankets because they didn't have any way of staying warm in the winter. So just mm -hmm. basic needs like that that we can help out with here is just feels really good. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. So Catherine, you want to talk a little bit about Mbogo? So I'm a visual journalism major. Um, and the reason I got into journalism is to uh, help educate others about uh, issues in the world and um, <coughs> different cultures and different ways of life. And that's within the United States and within the whole world. So um, I really jumped on this opportunity to go to Kenya and um, be able to bring back um, documentation and different types of media that would show the people of that in my community this other community. So um, my role while we were in Kenya, the Mbogo Girls <coughs> was to um, document uh, the service learning, our project that mm -hmm. was in the service learning program of uh, our group of uh, students and professors there and their interactions with the people there. Um, I also had the opportunity to um, interview uh, the Slum Doctor sponsored girls that uh, went to the school and they are all either uh, full or partial orphans. Um, most cases are that they, that they have lost uh, some or all of their families who uh, AIDS. And so 
I got to hear, I got to sit down with them and interview them and hear their stories, which was, it was <coughs> probably one of the hardest things I had to do. Um, you know, like, they were, they were very, uh, they were very hard stories to hear. Um, but it was also something that allowed um, me to bond with those girls. And um, it's something that, I'm working on projects now that will be used for Slum Doctor and for Western that will be able to educate people on, in our community on those stories. Mm -hmm. um, so. And you're also doing a marketing project for the school, is that right? Yeah, so I also interviewed um, girls on, uh, on BOGO, so I'll also be working on a project that will help bring more um, students to the school and attract uh, make the school attractive to other people in the community um, there. Right. So that, that marketing project for Mbogo was one of the needs that the director, Maureen, had identified um, prior to our coming. And so part of the way that the projects our students did while we were there was based on those issues that they had um, addressed. Um, another uh, issue that uh, the director had identified was career exploration for the young women. Um, many of them, if you ask the young women at the academy, uh, what do you want to be after you graduate, they would say doctor, lawyer, and then what's the third one? I, I don't know, but... Doctor, lawyer, engineer. Doctor, lawyer, engineer. And the, the reality is that very few of them will have the opportunity to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And not only because of their own academic development, but also because the access to higher education is also limited for these young women. And so part of what um, Catherine and uh, Julie and Heather, the other th uh, three of the women in the uh, student group did with the, uh, the young women was to explore what uh, what are the uh, uh, other kinds of careers that might be open to them um, and to, to sort of broaden their own horizons about what might be possible. And I think there's a lot of people who want to be journalists now or, yeah, or was, photographers. That was one uh, thing I didn't really, I wasn't expecting to be a role model when I went into that project. Um, I expected more to just be the kind of doing the documentation and being behind the camera, but um, I really, it became very apparent that a lot of these girls, you know, they think success comes from being, uh, having a high paying job. And so um, uh, the three other young women, I, the, other, the two other young women I was with, uh, none of us are going to med school, none of us are. <laughs> going to be lawyers. <laughs> so um, we, I think, you know, they, we, we got to like talk and interact with them. And, um, show them that we, you know, were success is defined in many different ways, and that um, mm -hmm. we just be an example of that. And I guess I, I would reflect that um, the having women that were closer to their own age than I am or Christy Tyron is or Shirlene Duke is uh, also had a huge impact. The the young women in in our um, our student group could interact um, more on a peer-to-peer -peer level with the young women from Mbogo than we can as elders. And uh, so there was there is that kind of power that we were able to accomplish uh, for one of the activities that the director of the uh, school had identified as an important activity. So thanks, Catherine. So I just want to summarize by um, talking a little bit about what I think are some of the important elements in developing this kind of uh, international service learning program. I mentioned the, the uh, key importance of reciprocity, and I can't stress that enough, how important it is that the kinds of activities that we engage in with these agencies are developed mutually that so they can benefit our students and uh, help our students learn the things we hope they will learn, but also be of real use to the community and not just what we might call service tourism, where you drop in and paint a wall and rush out again. Um, so, but it's actually uh, serving the need of, uh, of the institution. Another important thing I think is that there are opportunities to connect the learning while you're there. So in each of these uh, cases that we had on-site seminars um, with the students, um, meetings in which we would gather 
and uh, sometimes by ourselves and sometimes with uh, experts from the community um, to hear about uh, the ways that what we were doing might connect to the wider issues in that community or uh, to the um, important um, aspects of culture in that, in that area. And I think that, that, op that planful opportunity to do uh, on-site reflection about how your experience is connecting to your disciplinary work or to, your, uh, to the other work is really important. Um, the, uh, another one of the projects that we undertook uh, with uh, uh, Mbogo was one that um, Julie, this is Julie Lynch um, uh, talking to Maureen Okundi. And one of the other projects that uh, Maureen had identified was uh, the development of some enterprise projects that the young women could engage in that might bring uh, additional resources to them for scholarship or to the school for supplies. And um, Julie worked with Christy and Maureen to uh, identify a, a, local, um, a local person in the community who has skills in um, uh, making baskets and mats out of an invasive water hyacinth in Lake Victoria. So the, they're now beginning to work with that person to uh, teach the young women how to make these products that they could sell to bring a little income in for their, um, uh, for their school or for their own scholarship. It uh, also uh, directly supported Julie's own disciplinary goals. She is an international business student, and uh, so for her to be working in the area of enterprise development it made a great deal of sense in terms of her own academic learning. But it was a mutually beneficial uh, activity uh, in which both parties uh, benefited. Um, there was also an opportunity to develop leadership in, in both cases, where uh, both in Thailand and India and in um, Bogo, where the, the students were uh, given some uh, latitude to um, engage in activities with the uh, clientele we were working with on their own terms. So not only did the women at Mbogo um, spend time doing the marketing or doing the career exploration or doing the enterprise project, but they also uh, found activities that they wanted to do themselves with the young women and, and found the ways to provide their, their own leadership and initiative. And the same was true in the, both uh, Dharamsala and in uh, Sarnath, where the students were given some latitude to, d to go beyond what was uh, required as part of the service learning project. Um, there's also uh, an opportunity to reflect on the meaning that this, uh, these projects have in terms of their own um, uh, development as not only as in their academic work, but also in their personal lives. In what ways did what I learn um, change the way I think about myself as a global citizen? So um, in summary, uh, a good international service learning project, I think, has reciprocity. It uses community partners uh, as, uh, as peers and as equals. Um, it ha provides the opportunity for connected learning, for leadership development, and uh, has an avenue for students to reflect on the meaning of it. So I would be welcome to uh, have you ask questions or uh, engage the students. They're the real authorities on what ha happened. Um, engage them in some questions as well. Thank you.